looks like everyone's connected. Um, so I'm Stephanie Winters. I am the Executive Director of the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont Chapter, and I want to um, welcome you on behalf of the pediatricians in the state and also uh, send a special thanks to the Vermont Family Network, um, Jamie Reenville and Rachel Boyers for um, inviting us or, or setting up this opportunity for us to be able to speak with all of you about a really important topic. Um, so uh, thank you both for doing this. Um, the goal of tonight is really to have a conversation. And so uh, we have two pediatricians here um, who are really here to provide factual information and on the COVID-19 vaccine in children and adolescents and specifically um, children with disabilities and really have a conversation with all of you um, and, and open up, up to questions. Um, I'll just say on behalf of both Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Bell that um, I know that pediatricians are really honored to be a trusted source of information. And so um, on all vaccines and, and this vaccine is certainly no different. So. Uh, I welcome all of you. I thank you for taking uh, the time out. Hopefully you're all staying moderately cool um, uh, during this Vermont heat wave. Um, and just a few housekeeping things. Um, everyone is on mute. Uh, the chat box is open um, the entire time. So if you have questions as they come up, just type them in and Dr. Bell will moderate the chat box and be answering some of the questions as they come up, but also, um, also bring them up during the question and answer period, which will be at the end. Um, the, the live transcript is on for anyone who needs it or, or, would li or likes it. Um, but if you want to turn that off, there's a uh, at the toolbar at the bottom, you can hit the live transcript button and you, it says hide subtitle. So that will hide that for you. So uh, with that, I would, uh, I'm honored to introduce um, Dr. Jill Reinhardt, who will be our presenter this evening. Dr. Reinhardt is a general pediatrician at Pediatric Primary Care in Williston, and she's also the pediat Pediatric Residency Program Director at the UVM Larner College of Medicine. And she's the immediate, uh, and, and immediate, the immediate past president of the chapter. Uh, and Dr. Becca Bell, who will be moderating the chat tonight, is the current president of the AAP Vermont chapter and is a pediatric critical care physician at the UVM Medical Center. So thank you all again for being with us. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Bell. And with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Dr. Reinhardt to start the presentation. Great. I will go ahead and share my screen as I welcome everybody today. Thanks for joining us today. We uh, are so excited to have an opportunity um, to have a vaccine and then to talk a little bit about it and um, any concerns people have. Um, I'm going to play. Are we doing okay with slide one? Good, great. Um, and thank you to everyone who put their time into uh, helping with these slides tonight. Um, um, today, we're going to do a little bit of an overview of COVID itself, the disease process in kids in Vermont, um, and uh, remind us that this has been a difficult time for mental health for our youth in our state. Um, we have a brief video from uh, Dr. Bell to present, and then hopefully just give you some information straight from the, the mouths of the kids themselves on their concerns around the vac vaccine, and then have some time for questions and answers as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a situation update that we were getting um, almost every day, and now we're getting them weekly, and soon it will be monthly. Um, and this is uh, from May, but if you look here, these are the actual cases um, per 10,000 lives across the bottom by age. Um, and so we know really, really well where the, the cases are and who's getting them. Um, and as uh, we've learned there's a, uh, a definite um, uh, preponderance of, uh, of uh, cases in some minority groups throughout the country and Vermont is not any different. Um, so when we look at school age children, again, the bottom line here is the time and these are all ages um, uh, uh, five to 18. You can see that the, the peak cases per 10,000 here 
really um, the highest were 280 in April of this past year. Um, and the levels have been going down pretty consistently. Um, uh, for COVID itself, I think um, there's been a lot of concern about schools and kids being together in schools and sharing uh, COVID. And we've really learned that we can go to school and it doesn't uh, create um, huge problems, which has been wonderful. And we, our state, I think, has really benefited from having, um, uh, having kids in school. So here we are just by, by week for school category and the green line is high school, the uh, black line is middle school and that blue line is our elementary school. And you can see how cases overall are um, de declining as time goes on and as our community becomes um, immunized, our children are protected uh, a lot by that. Um, go to the next slide. Um, uh, so we've had some focus groups done with, with youth in our state, and this is a specific uh, highlight of the way that kids have felt during this pandemic. And, um, you know, the, this young person says, we have Zoom, Google Meet, FaceTime, and every other form of video at our fingertips, but we don't have a true connection. There's, um, there's no replacement for the smiles in the hallway, the feeling of winning playoff games, and the satisfaction of knowing the correct answer. Uh, she goes on, we wanna be kids, but the pandemic has forced us to grow. Uh, we are, we, but we feel so aged by all we have been dealt. We wanna cry about what we're missing as we're still just kids trying to cope, but we also know that we're grateful for our health and safety. And we feel guilty, relieved, and completely terrified. Doesn't that sound a little familiar? Um, and the teens are saying, we're big kids, we can handle the truth, but we also want our loved ones to hold us tight and tell us it'll be all right. We miss our lives, we miss just being kids. Uh, and so, you know, in the practice setting, all of those sick calls that we used to see frequently, ear infections, runny nose, coughs, have been really replaced by mental health concerns of our youth. So uh, depression, a lot of anxiety, we've had a rise in eating disorders uh, through this pandemic. Um, and, uh, and so we've had to come up with strategies to mitigate that. And I'm gonna play this now, if I can. Hi there, I'm Becca Bell. I'm a pediatrician in Burlington and the current president of the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I'm just gonna take a few moments to talk about how excited we are as pediatricians that the COVID-19 vaccine is available for young people now. So I'm a pediatric intensivist, which means I take care of children in the pediatric intensive care unit at UVM Children's Hospital. And I take care of infants, children, and adolescents who are critically ill or injured. And so vaccines are something that have always been really important to me because they help prevent a lot of the very serious illness I sometimes see in the ICU when children are too young or haven't been vaccinated against um, a vaccine preventable infection. And when I think back to last spring when everything was shutting down and I was working with some of my other ICU colleagues who care for adults, and we were really worried about the number of ventilators and the number of hospital beds. If you had told me then, a year ago, that we would have a number of safe and effective vaccines, vaccines that in trials, when tested on tens of thousands of people, prevented people from not just dying, but even becoming seriously ill enough to even be in the hospital, I, I don't know if I would have believed it. It's amazing how effective these vaccines are. And a lot of people are wondering, how were we able to get these vaccines so quickly? Um, it seems like quite a feat. And, you know, in pediatrics, we're used to vaccines taking a little bit longer. Um, and part of that is that there's a lot of competing interests in terms of what type of um, research and technology gets funded, right? Lots of competing interests there. And when we test vaccines on other types of infections, usually those infections aren't as common, aren't as prevalent. And so it takes a while to get all that data. But with COVID-19, as we all know, the world stopped. 
last spring, just completely stopped. And the biggest priority that everyone had in the world was stopping this virus. And that what that meant really was having safe and effective vaccines that became the top, top priority. And so every effort was turned towards that. All this funding was turned towards that. And a ton of collaboration happened um, in order to make this possible. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, the vaccines that you all qualify for, um, are eligible for, or will be soon, and that's the messenger RNA vaccine. So that's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So this is a technology that's been in use in cancer therapies, um, and also scientists have been using it to study vaccines um, for other infections. And so when they um, when the world was told what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looked like, that was something that was shared with everyone, people got to work. Um, and so they used this technology that already existed and they um, made it applicable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And because there was so much funding towards going towards this, um, they were able to make this happen on a little bit of a quicker timeline than than usual but all the steps were there they went through every single step and because COVID-19 is so prevalent when they did the efficacy trials to see if it worked um, and they gave vaccine to some people and a placebo to other people they saw very quickly that the people who received the vaccine weren't getting sick um, from COVID-19 and the people who didn't receive it um, were getting sick. And that data was collected so quickly that they were able to get a pretty definitive answer that these vaccines are really effective. And one thing that I think is so interesting about the mRNA vaccine is that it's, it really gives your body instructions for how to make a protein that looks like what's on the virus. So what do I mean by that? So when you get the vaccine, this mRNA is like a little piece of instruction, or I almost think about it like, like a handwritten recipe that's sort of passed down in your family, right? You have a piece of paper with a recipe, and then these are instructions. And your cells can make, based on the instructions, can make a spike protein with that. Then once it's made, recipe goes away, um, and the mRNA, it just kind of disintegrates and disappears. And then what you have is this harmless spike protein um, that's not the virus, but is similar enough that your immune system can look at it, recognize it, and get ready for it in case they ever see the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and this is really important because this is what will stop the virus from replicating throughout your body if you're exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and making you very sick. And one of the things we know in intensive care medicine is that these viruses, SARS-CoV-2 in particular, the virus itself can cause a problem in your body. It can cause direct injury and illness. But the other problem is on the other end, when your immune system is trying to fight off that virus, it, the, that fight, that battle that happens can create a ton of inflammation and a lot of problems and a lot of illness. So it's that back and forth between it's the virus and your immune system. When you get exposed to the virus, when you get sick, that can make you really sick. Now, in someone who's been vaccinated, Instead, they see, their body sees the virus and their immune system's already ready. They already have the antibodies. They recognize it really quickly before the virus can kind of get out of hand. And they've got the cells ready that they know they need to fight off this virus. And that's why people aren't getting very sick. They're not dying. And um, if anything, they might have a mild cold after being vaccinated. And that is... What's so amazing is that these vaccines give your cells this recipe for how to create the spike protein. Your body then, your immune system then learns it, 
understands it, recognizes it, and gets ready for it. So when the first um, authorization happened, um, first with Pfizer in December, I was one of the lucky ones to get vaccinated pretty early. And as you can imagine, there were lines of doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers who were just so excited to get this vaccine. I mean, it was, it, it was emotional. Um, I felt emotional getting, getting the vaccine for the first time, knowing that I was protecting my body. And then I got my second shot in January and had the expected, many people kind of feel crummy the next day because they have that, um, they can sense their immune system sort of recognizing again, um, the spike protein and sort of revving up for it. And then fine after a day, felt fine after a day. And it's just been so amazing seeing my rest of my family and my friends and my colleagues and everyone I love getting vaccinated. Um, my own children are too young right now. They don't qualify, but I'm gonna be so relieved and so grateful when the vaccines are approved for their age group um, and they will be first in line. So I just wanted to spend a moment just to really let everyone know that, you know, we're living in this really, really challenging time. Um, this virus has really wreaked havoc directly and indirectly, and it's affected all of us. But there is this really bright spot, and that is this, these vaccines are, they're really effective, and they're really doing what we want them to do, which is to keep us from getting sick. Um, and we really want you to ask questions. If you have questions about the vaccine, we're here for you. Pediatricians are really excited that our, the people we love, our patients are going to get vaccinated soon. And we're happy to walk you and your family through this process and work towards getting our communities healthy and getting back to doing all the stuff that we love doing. So thank you so much for listening and um, please feel free to reach out to your pediatrician and, and reach out to us and um, we're happy to work with you on this. Take care. Why? That was fantastic. I don't know that I need to say anything more. <laughs> that was great. I mean, um, let's see if I can exit it. There we go. Um, forward. So I do want to add to that too, actually Dr. Bell and I were together when we got our first vaccine and that, that feeling of like just tears and um, emotion that, that overcame us. And uh, it was only um, overshadowed by the, the way I felt when my 19 year old finally got his vaccine. And it's just you know, when you can protect your family um, and feel really confident about that, it's an amazing. Um, amazing feeling. I had a young girl today who's 12 who has a chronic condition and she just received her second one today and I asked her about it and I asked if I could share this story with you tonight and she said oh yeah of course of course and she um, was a little hesitant with her first vaccine and then um, this the second one um, she was really excited for because her really good friend of her had just had a baby and the baby was like going to be six months old and she hadn't been able to see the baby because she wasn't vaccinated and she was school aged and um, uh, so her motivation for really wanting the vaccine was so she could spend time with her friend's little baby and keep that baby safe too and I think we forget sometimes that yes it's scary but um, there's the power there of doing something that helps protect other people uh, that's so so important. Um, so why vaccinate? You know, obviously, um, you don't have to, we have all these reasons. You don't have to quarantine as much. Um, you get some freedom. You don't have to wear a mask when you're outside. If you're vaccinated, um, you get to see your friends and little babies, um, and you get to live a more no normal life. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, very motivating, uh, for, for young people. Um, 
And as a parent, I'm sure you have questions about the vaccines. And Dr. Bell, you did such a great job of sort of reducing the mechanics of how the vaccine works to be very, very simple. And I think, um, you know, although it's been authorized um, for teens, it's so wonderful that that we're able to get the population studied to have it available now since May for that 12 to 15 year group. And hopefully we'll be lowering that age uh, range in the near future. Um, and, and as Dr. Bell said, the vaccine really does work similarly to the other vaccines your child has received. Um, the germs, and we call the germ for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, that um, you know invades and multiplies inside the body. The vaccine stops it by helping your immune system make special proteins that we call antibodies to fight the virus. And after the vaccine, your child will have less chance of getting the COVID. And even more importantly, I think, is if they do get infected with the virus, they may not be as sick as they would be without the vaccine. So it limits their um, morbidity and the problems that they have with the, the the illness itself. Um, very powerful. Um, there are three different vaccines um, authorized for emergency use by the, the FDA so far. Two of those shots require two doses, so the Pfizer and the Moderna. And the Pfizer vaccine is the one currently authorized for the youth use between ages 12 and 17. Um, and then there's one vaccine that is a single shot, which a lot of families prefer, especially if they have uh, a young adult or child that is really um, difficult to vaccinate or um, uh, has a lot of anxiety around that. And that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was temporarily um, put on hold for possible ties to a very rare but serious blood clotting disorder um, during that vaccine safety monitoring process. Um, but essentially the monitoring process actually worked and they, they took a pause, they confirmed the data, and then they, they realized that there's a very, very low chance of developing the rare clots um, uh, for, from that vaccine. Um, and that certainly the potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks to individuals who are 18 years of age and older. So how effective are the vaccines? You know, research really shows that all of the COVID vaccines are highly effective at stopping people from getting COVID-19. They also help prevent serious illness, the hospitalization and death that we've seen uh, from those who get COVID-19. Uh, but we're not yet sure how long the immunity from the vaccine will protect people. Um, and this will become clearer in the future as we watch those levels of antibodies change in people and as they study this. So it may be possibly that we need to have a booster vaccine in the future. Is one type of vaccine better than the others? You know, all three vaccines are safe and similarly effective at preventing hospitalization and death, um, but it's really hard to directly compare how effective the three vaccines are because they weren't studied against each other at the same time. Each clinical trial had a different study protocol, a different timing, a different location. Um, and at that time, the variants that we've heard about um, weren't as widely circulating um, when the, the earlier vaccines were being tested. Um, but the vaccines that are available have similar side effects. Side effects are, are really just a normal way your body builds immunity to COVID-19. When I had my first COVID vaccine in December, I didn't have any problem with that one at all. Um, the second one, I was a little punky for just about a day, day and a half, um, took a nap on the couch with the dogs and felt better the next day. And how do we know that the vaccines are safe for youth? Um, we know that they're remarkably safe and effective for um, youth age 12 and up. And trials for each of these vaccines have involved tens of thousands of volunteers. Um, I just met uh, another little girl in my practice who is going to be a volunteer and she's so excited. She's like eight or nine. She's going to be in one of the studies. Um, and they continue to be monitored incredibly closely. The, the CDC says that the vaccines will have the most intensive safety monitoring of any vaccine in U.S. history. Um, which is fantastic. Oops, oops, hang on. There we go. Um, and what about side effects of the vaccine? Some people don't have any side effects at all. 
the most common um, side effects that have been reported um, are fatigue, nausea, fever, pain in the muscles, um, kind of how you feel when you're beginning to get a little bit of a, a flu or illness or cold. These side effects are temporary and they go away within a, a few days um, and even are relieved by some Tylenol and drinking a lot of water. Those things have been shown to be very helpful too. Um, it does take about two weeks um, after getting the second dose of Pfizer for the vaccine to be fully effective. It takes that time for your body to build up the immunity to the, to the, to the virus itself. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and for the one vaccine, um, the one shot vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson, it does take up to four weeks for that immunity to be um, protected. Um, and, and really COVID vaccines are free. Um, whether or not you have health insurance, um, this is something you won't ever have to pay for. So the clinical trial for younger adolescents ages 12 to 15 show that the vaccine for kids under age 16 is safe and effective. And now we're beginning trials for children as young as six months old. What about getting other vaccines at the same time? It's absolutely okay. You know, um, it's a good time to make sure that all of our young people are up to date on vaccines. This past year and a half, I think people have missed some of their checkups. And so coming in to, to your medical home um, and making sure that your child has, is getting all the vaccines possible. Um, we now have in many medical homes and soon to be uh, widely available COVID vaccine for 12 and up um, in the primary care practices as well. Um, and so given how important vaccination is and the need for the rapid uptake of the COVID vaccine, we as a AAP chapter do support administering the routine vaccines along with COVID-19 vaccines. There's no reason to separate or do that in a different pattern. Here is some information about how and where to register for the vaccines um, at different sites. Um, and again, I think I would encourage people to contact your primary care medical home, your pediatrician, and see what their plan is for starting to immunize um, at your own practice too. Um, I think, you know, we're just in the medical home used to vaccinating kids and used to vaccinating people of different um, uh, developmental stages and ages uh, and can do so safely and hopefully without too much um, burden on you and your child. Um, again, you can schedule an appointment. Uh, we had some school clinics going, but um, there are still um, uh, registration available at other places as well. I was so impressed that my 19 year old did this on his own. It's like, you know, you have that transition to adult medical home that happens and you're like, and like he found the right place, drove up to St. Albans, got his shots. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Um, but you can help get your child vaccinated this way. Um, yeah, so we probably don't need to talk too much about the school-based clinics, although what a wonderful, uh, uh, opportunity for this for kids to get the vaccine in a safe place um, and then plenty of more um, information here we use uh, healthychildren.org uh, for really readable understandable information about a whole host of pediatric issues um, and they've been translated into different voices um, there was another um, uh, website today that I found that's about teenagers specifically being able to vaccinate if they want the vaccine themselves, um, uh, which is fab fabulous. And now I think we'll shift over to some questions. Hopefully we'll have some answers, but um, let me just stop sharing here. And there you all are. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Reinhardt. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the experience your clinic is having so far? So it's 
pretty new that the primary care clinics are, are getting the, the vaccine. Everyone's really excited about it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how that's going in the, in yeah. the clinic? Yeah, yeah I, I happened to have a staycation last week and went, went away, didn't, wasn't in the clinic, came back on Monday. We hadn't even been talking about it, really. We were like, oh, someday soon, maybe by the end of the summer, we'll have vaccine. Came back and we actually have a supply in our office now. Um, and I know that, that the hope is that all pediatric practices will be able to have the vaccine to distribute to their patients as well. Um, you've probably heard that storage of this vaccine can was tricky at one point. And so, um, um, but it's it's um, similar to the way we store other vaccines. The other thing with vaccines, you know, we, we try not to waste doses, but we are in a place now where there's enough vaccine that if we have to waste a dose in order to protect a one person, we're going to do that. Um, and in our practice, which I think will all be state supplied, a vial will have five doses in it. And that vial is good for a certain number of, of hours. Um, so it's nice if you can get, you know, the whole family, that'd be great. Um, but we want to vaccinate as many people as possible. So one of the attendees um, ahead of the um, the session had had written in um, and said, "What are our options for getting an eligible child vaccinated if if he or she won't sit still or is resistant?" And so um, that question may have been written not knowing that you know the clinics, the primary care clinics are now now have the vaccine. Um, and I'll, I'll let you add on to, to my thoughts, but I think like Dr. Reinhardt said, our clinics are, I mean, we back, are vaccinating kids every, of all ages, all types, all the time. And so if your child has been, has received other vaccines, you may have, um, you know, depending on your child, you you may have different techniques that you use. Um, you know, we never tell children things aren't going to hurt, um, but you know, we're very realistic with them, but there are lots of distraction tools. Um, and depending on the, your child's age and you know, their interests, I think it's um, your pediatrician's office might have some ideas too. But if your child's been vaccinated before, it could just be just like any other vaccine that they've received in the past. I don't know if you have other yeah. things to add to that. Yeah, you know, I think we have a routine and um, it's a comfortable place. Kids are used to having vaccines. Certainly with some of our, um, our patients um, with high anxiety or autism uh, spectrum, um, you know, a little extra TLC is definitely needed. And so uh, being able to be in a place where people are comfortable working with the population, I think um, is really helpful. The other thing I'm finding too, is that a lot of teenagers don't like to get shots. They don't want to say they're afraid, but they're afraid <laughs> of getting a shot. And so sometimes just having a frank conversation about that and offering some distractions, you know, a little ice cube goes a long way actually to decreasing the, the feel of a poke um, and just taking your time and creating that trust. Um, and, and for the really extreme kids who are no, needle phobic, we do have therapists who can kind of do a couple sessions with them just to desensitize them and get them used to the idea for kids that have the, the that want to have that cognitive approach. Um, uh, but that's pretty, pretty rare. Dr. Reinhardt, would you suggest, um, you know, if families are, are interested and they're coming in for a visit that they, you know, but they think they might need some extra time or extra TLC, as you said, that they would call it, should they call ahead and just say, oh, hey, yeah. we're really interested in this, like, yeah. we may need a little extra time, or, you know, how would you suggest they approach that? Absolutely. I think that's, that's always to the benefit of, um, to, to know that we might need an extra set of hands or a certain particular nurse that your child knows well, or something like that, that, um, that can be helpful. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we have, you know, distraction kits in a lot of our offices too that help. Um, but it's, you know, if you know that your, your kiddo is, is nervous, it might be nice for them to bring something of their own that's really special that helps them to feel safe. Um, and that can uh, go a long way. Or a highly desirable toy <laughs> that goes a long way too, um, that you just pull out when that's happening. Um, that can help a lot. Um, we do a lot with um, band-aids and aftercare and, you know, giving them a big dance when that's all done. Um, and they, you know, that pride that they feel from accomplishing it is really amazing. And to let them know that they can go through something that's hard and come out the other side and be just fine, if not better. <laughs> 
So another question that an attendee had was, um, which you answered in, um, in your talk a bit, but we could maybe talk a little bit more about what that would look like practically is about the younger kids and when they'll be eligible. And, and so with, so right now it's really the mRNA vaccines that will probably be, those are the ones that are eligible for adoles adolescents are eligible for now and will be probably the first to be Pfizer and Moderna for the younger kids. Um, likely in the fall is sort of what it looks like in terms of when they'll submit the data. And so we are really looking forward to having younger kids eligible September, maybe October. And we're not quite sure what that age group is. We've, uh, you know, maybe two to two and up or five and up. Um, and so, so it would be the same process where the primary, you know, you would call your child's primary care, pediatrician's office, family medicine office, and, um, and, and schedule an appointment. Um, I don't know if you have any other things to add, add to the younger kids piece of things. No, I think, um, you know, we're, you're coming in frequently for those regular visits under age three anyway. And so if we get the vaccine eligible, we'll just jump it in right with that routine visit. Um, and I suspect as Stephanie's writing in the chats that we're gonna have more collaborations with schools as well. Um, and that's another way of helping kids to get vaccines. When you're all doing it together with your friends to benefit one another, that's a pretty powerful thing um, to have it done with schools. Yeah. And another attendee asked about this question about myocarditis, which I think is a, you know, a big thing in the news right now. So I think it'd be a good thing to chat about too. Um, and the question was around um, a, a child who has a congenital heart condition. Um, and extra worries about myocarditis and whether there's one vaccine that's better than another for that. Um, and I can, I can sort of start with what I know and then Dr. Reinhardt, you can add to that. Um, so the cases of myocarditis, so myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle and pericarditis is inflammation of the lining of the heart. And this can happen really in anyone at any time for any reason. It's very rare, but it's something that we have seen, I have seen for years and years since I've been a practicing pediatric intensivist. This is something that I admit children to the ICU for. So it's not new with COVID and not new with the COVID vaccine. And so we do have, um, in particular, it's most common in adolescents, in um, more, slightly more common in males and females, so adolescents, young adults, um, and typically the symptoms are around chest pain, and that is usually what prompts people to, to seek care. And then um, we look and we can see evidence of inflammation of the heart. Um, so that's something that happens kind of all the time. It's there. And so, so part of vaccine surveillance is around trying to pick up things that happen, but are they happening more? And could that be related to the vaccine? Um, and so when we do, um, when the companies were doing the initial trials, they're looking at tens of thousands of people and so that they can pick up something that might happen one in 10,000 cases or one in 50,000 cases. And then once the vaccine becomes widely available, it's very closely monitored. And that piece to me is very reassuring because then you can pick up something that might be happening one in 100,000 or one in a million. Um, and so that's what happened with the J&J &J vaccine around the blood clot issue. And that's sort of what is what happening with the, the um, mRNA vaccines and myocarditis. So what we're seeing is it seems like we're having more cases of myocarditis than we typically see. And this is like a little bit of a hard number to know because we don't like report to the state when we get a case of myocarditis. So we have a general idea of about how many cases we generally think we see. And then we think we're seeing more than we would expect. Um, it's, and, and it's around, usually around the time of the vaccine. So if you're vaccinating an entire population, if people are always gonna get myocarditis, what, we're, what we wanna see is whether there's gonna be an increase in that. So, um, so it does look like there might be an increase. Um, not sure for sure that there's like a causal relationship between the vaccine and these cases, but this is something that's being looked at really carefully, which to me is very reassuring. 
the cases that have happened um, have all been really mild. Everyone's recovered and um, with really minimal intervention. So not needing like a lot of medical intervention to recover. It's, it's something that happens and then they recover from. Um, so this is worth looking at, into, but it's still super rare. Um, the other thing is that oftentimes myocarditis is caused by a viral infection and COVID-19 infection definitely causes myocarditis. And although these numbers are really hard to compare, it does really seem like cases of myocarditis caused by COVID-19 infection are more common than those that may be caused by the vaccine. So for sure, we are all saying it's definitely, you know, the, the benefits of getting the vaccine are much, much higher than um, the risk of potential myocarditis that may be associated with the vaccine because the infection itself can cause both myocarditis. It can also cause something called um, what we call MIS-C, so multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome in children. Um, which is this like hyperinflammatory state that the virus can cause. So, so definitely the the benefits outweigh the risks there. Um, Dr. Reinhardt, do you have any other thoughts to that question? No, you know, I think I spent some time just digging through and looking at the population of children with various disorders and the consequences of COVID and looking at, as you have, like, not many kids end up in the intensive care unit or even hospitalized with COVID at all, but of the kids, who are those kids? Um, and certainly we know that kids with um, congenital um, genetic disorders tend to have uh, more likely to have a complication um, with COVID that might increase the risk of hospitalization. Um, obesity, however, is like the number one uh, comorbid chronic condition that increases a kid's risk for getting, um, uh, having high complications with COVID. Um, and so in any case, you know, I've been a real advocate as all of us have for making sure that children with medical complexity um, do opt to get the vaccine because the risk of the disease to them is really high. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Along those lines. Um, so I actually am an infectious disease epidemiologist at oh. Dartmouth, and um, I also have a five-year-old who is medically complex, and um, he has several risk factors. He has the genetic uh, condition, and he's got neurological condition, and he's also just been uh, in the PICU a bunch of times with respiratory viruses. Like, we would all get yeah. a cold, and he would go in the PICU every time. So um, we've been quite concerned about him. And um, I, you know, I feel like I don't, I can't speak for everybody in my position, but for, for I think for a lot of us with medically complex young children, this is a really awkward time because um, what I hear, you know, you say, and I, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. I've studied vaccines. I'm, this vaccine, these, you know, these vaccines are, are um, like you said, amazing. They are, um, there's, it's, we're so lucky to have them. And I'm just, you know, counting down the days and I wish I knew what day it was coming for my young child because I'd be counting down the days on my calendar. Um, I'm so anxious for him to get it. And, um, but I think that this interim period until it's authorized for the younger kids is feeling like a really awkward time for me because, um, like you said, when you get your vaccine, it opens up a lot of freedom for you. You can go around without a mask. You can go to, you know, you can go into crowds. You can do a lot of the things that we've all been waiting, you know, um, till the end of this pandemic to do. And for people with their vaccine, you know, we kind of feel like we're, we're getting back to normal life. And that's obviously a wonderful thing for most people, but for families of young kids with medical complexity, um, we're not back to normal because our kids are still vulnerable. And I think one of the other things I hear, I heard you highlighting and I hear, you know, highlighted all the time by, by public health and, and, and physicians is um, that how wonderful these vaccines are at, pre at preventing hospitalization and death. And I, I know what that means. That means that they're wonderful at preventing hospitalization and death. And I've read the, I've read the trials. And what reading between the lines, what that means is 
they aren't perfect at pre preventing asymptomatic infection. And, uh, you know, with a, with a barely a minority of the, I know that, you know, a large proportion of the eligible population is vaccinated now, but, um, you know, um, we still have a long way to go with getting the full population vaccinated. We haven't reached any sort of herd immunity. COVID is still spreading, uh, is still is still you know being widely transmitted in in every state, in every probably in every county. It's not. I wouldn't say. I don't think we can say it's under control yet. Um, it just it's it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit scary to think about. You know, I I I took my uh, my my five year old to our elementary school a couple weeks ago uh, to do some things around his IEP, and nobody's wearing a mask anymore. No teachers wearing masks, and you know, I know exactly what the the uh, degree of protection is against asymptomatic infection, and it's it's okay. Like it's better than, <laughs> it's better than fifty fifty. It's better than nothing, but it's not perfect, and uh, it's just. I just, I hear, uh, I don't hear anything in, um, you know, the recommendations or the, you know, what's going on at these upper levels of leadership around medically complex kids and how we're going to protect them in the fall. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real, uh, you know, the silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. And what we hear a lot of is, you know, kids in general are not, uh, not getting complications from COVID and, you know, I even hear things like, don't worry, the kids who do get seriously ill from COVID tend to be, you know, the ones with underlying conditions and, you know, yeah. just reading people saying things like that in the news and stuff. And it's like, okay, we're like, here we are, yes. we do ex <laughs> exist. And I know you, 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 you are all sensitive to that and uh, you're treating kids like mine all the time and they're part of your practice, but it's just, it's, uh, you know, we're getting left out in this discussion by and large, and this time in particular, when some people are protected and others aren't, and the ones who aren't tend to be kids, and most kids aren't too worried about COVID, uh, with good, you know, maybe with good reason, um, but some of them do need to be, and it's just, it's a really, it's an awkward time. I just have to say that, and I just wondered what your thoughts are about that, and what, what can we do going into the fall to make sure that our kids can go to school safely, and, you know, because I think that, I don't think that it's time to, to stop wearing masks and do distancing in, in elementary schools until, until we get the vaccine there for the little kids. Yeah. Oh, Annie, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. You know, I've had very similar conversations and I will share at the end an article that one of our families wrote um, for the Hastings report about that ethical dilemma of having a kid with medical complexity who can't be vaccinated, who essentially the rest of the world is finally experiencing life the way that you have experienced it for five years. And um, and uh, and that that reversal, it just feels so hard, the transition from everyone being protected to suddenly now you're back to being very vulnerable. Um, and I don't know what the, 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 the real answer is, but I, I agree with you that the, that the voice um, should be raised on this issue. And we've been really, you know, advocating to have all the caregivers of kids with special needs and medical complexity to get vaccinated in a timely fashion as well to do their best to protect. I've had patients individually with, um, who just decided to remain home and homeschool, that to me, it's oh, such an individual decision, um, you know, and, and working with their IEP to have remote access to things, especially if, you know, co we see COVID rates rise. So that to me makes sense from an IEP standpoint, you know, if there's suddenly an outbreak or a case or two in the community and the community raises that you can quickly switch his education to at home and to have that flexibility. Um, and so when I do interdisciplinary teaming with schools and families, that's one thing we're really trying to put in. So like, there's no loss of school for two weeks because someone in the class had COVID, you know, that that child can still have access to their IEP and their, and their teaching um, goals. Um, and, uh, and certainly I'm seeing Dr. Bell's comments there too, reminding people that kids aren't, aren't protected. So we're wearing masks to protect them as well. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. Annie, it's, it's, that's exactly what our chapter was worried about is, um, and, and sort of balancing, you know, for sure our communities as a whole um, were safer because we have higher vaccination rates now and balancing like, 
that is awesome and should be celebrated and recognized, but there's a portion of our population that has not yet had the opportunity to, to protect themselves. And um, I, I'm using part of that as a plea to the, uh, I, I did a news interview on this last week and I calculated it out. It's like 100,000 Vermonters who could be vaccinated who are not yet vaccinated. So using that as saying like, we've got every kid under 12 is not vaccinated in Vermont and many want to be, and many of their caregivers are desperate to have them vaccinated. So, um, so really thinking about that um, and understanding that if you're not vaccinated, you know, you definitely need to wear a mask. Um, the question about the asymptomatic um, spread, I think, you know, trying to understand, and you know so much, this is like your job, trying to really understand what is the risk of asymptomatic spread is obviously very challenging. Um, and, you know, part of it, so we start like with the bigger, like how much COVID do we have like in the community to start with? Like what's the likelihood that somebody who's, who's your child comes into contact with someone who's either vaccinated and has, you know, virus in their nose that could potentially be passed on or, or an adult who's unvaccinated or another kid who's unvaccinated, who, who you know, who has it. So um, I think that first step is better and it's gonna be better because, you know, we, have, we do have so many people vaccinated compared to say like when we were having these discussions a year ago about what school is gonna look like. Um, but I do think that we really need to remind people that, you know, there's a lot, a lot of kids in Vermont who want to be vaccinated that can't, you know, they can't yet be. So we've been trying really hard to, um, to put that word out there. The other thing I would say, because you brought this up and I've been talking about this too, to the press is that, um, and I don't want people to forget this either, is that. I spent all winter taking care of kids in the ICU with RSV, with flu, with meningovirus, with adenovirus, with rhinovirus, who, who get very sick. And it sounds like your child has gotten really sick from these common viruses. And I don't, we've learned some good lessons with COVID because we've had no RSV, we've had no flu this year. So when we understand that there are young, young kids, medically vulnerable kids who can get really sick from colds. What can we do about that going forward? And what sort of responsibilities do we have as adults to pay attention to our own symptoms, to wear a mask, to not send our kids to school, to not go to work when we have these viruses? Um, and I, I really don't want that to get lost because I'm afraid people now are gonna be like, well, oh, I'm coughing and sneezing. I'm vaccinated, it's not COVID, and they might even get COVID tests if they don't have it. But maybe it's rhinovirus and you pass that on to, to a kid with really severe asthma and you pass it on to a young kid with pulmonary insufficiency. And they, so I think there's a lot of other COVID aside, there's like a lot that we could um, learn about and think about around keeping vulnerable folks in our community safe. And I, and I do think that, you know, I, I have young kids myself who, you know, I've been like, you know, keeping them home from daycare with really like mild symptoms because I know, you know, they could pass that on. And I think having, we're all having better conversations with friends and family, if we're going to gather to say, oh, actually my child has a cold or I have a cold, let's not do that. And I think we should really continue to be transparent with that because it's not just COVID that like kids are getting really, kids get really sick from and nobody pays attention to the number of you know kids I intubate every winter for with RSV right who are like on the vent and you know are on BiPAP and like in the PICU and like we could we could like chip away at that like we could do a better job as a community around that so I, I do hope that this continues not just around if we had zero cases of COVID, I still think we should be ma like not going to work if we're sick. We should be masking if we have any cold symptoms. Like this needs to be part, we should be talking to each other about our symptoms. Like this needs to be part of the conversation going forward. I don't know if you notice that Annie with your child had a better respiratory viral season this year than the past. <laughs> Well, uh, we did homeschool. So I have an eight-year-old also who was homeschooled because we, you know, this is a communicable disease that we didn't want her to bring home, and we worked from home. And we were, 
yeah, we had a better season because we <laughs> didn't go anywhere. And uh, it was great not having any cold this year. I didn't even get you know, much to the chagrin of our pediatrician, I didn't even get my kids flu shots because I was like, you know, let me give them one one nice thing, <laughs> not take them for their annual flu shot because I knew we weren't we weren't going to have any contact with anybody all all um, all winter. I mean, we didn't we did you know grocery curbside pickup and we did everything. We you know really we really changed our lifestyle and it was great not having any colds. But you know, I'm almost more. Con I, you know, I really agonized last fall about whether to send my eight-year-old, my, my five-year-old was a preschooler and we did not, he, we took him out of preschool and didn't send him back. And I'm sure that that was detrimental to his, you know, early development. Um, and he's already, you know, he's already behind because he's developmentally delayed. And, um, but, but I, but we agonized over whether to send my eight-year-old to school and we ended up homeschooling her. And this summer, I almost, you know, I was really thinking by with the, when the vaccines came out, I thought, well, this year's, this fall is going to be such, it's going to be a slam dunk. We're going to get vaccinated and go to school. And, and I'm almost finding it more difficult to make that decision for this fall because we go to school and nobody's wearing a mask. Like we don't, you know, everybody's just going about their business as if nothing's wrong. And the reality is we're still living in a pandemic. We, our youngest children are not vaccinated. They're very important <laughs> to us, you know? And uh, I can't imagine sending him into a building with all the people who don't, aren't eligible to get their vaccine yet, uh, all there and no masks. Like it's, that doesn't, that's totally illogical to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have, I, I, I'm on, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. It's a small group. I'm on the task force at Dartmouth and we've been doing twice weekly, you know, asymptomatic screening tests, like many colleges and universities have all year long. And now the students are starting to be vaccinated and they're still getting their screening tests. We're having, you know, breakthrough cases, uh, infections. Of, and people are asymptomatic are pretty are being pr pretty routinely picked up by places that are doing this asymptomatic screening and uh you know i i think it's i think it's sketchy to conclude uh that you know this isn't going around in schools on an asymptom on a largely asymptomatic basis when we haven't been doing we haven't done that study you know we haven't done that study uh of screening people routinely asymptomatic, you know, asymptomatically in schools. Mm -hmm. The lack of, you know, in picking up infections among a group that is likely to be asymptomatic in the first place because they're young and, and which is a, you know, wonderful blessing, but a uh, lack of positives in that group is as a function of not testing is, is not that reassuring to me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more worried going into this fall, unless cases, you know, unless cases, unless we really start to not really see it circulating in our community um, due to high vaccination rates, like I'm more concerned this fall because people are, people are over it, you know, mm -hmm. there's no more mitigation happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I yeah, it's such a challenging and unique and individual calculation, right? Mm -hmm. To like, and it's it's also dynamic, mm -hmm. right? It's like what what's the, what do we have in terms of a vaccinated population, and, and what really matters is like your your real community. Um, and yeah. so even looking at bigger numbers, certainly across the country, that doesn't matter so much. So it is such a unique um, a unique calculation to to think about. Mm -hmm. um, we have. Um, and again, it's all, it's all about like, you know, the numbers and what people feel comfortable with. I, I would say having, you know, been involved in following the school and childcare stuff all year mm -hmm. that, I mean, we went through the year where nobody was vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, and people were doing their best with masks and, and, and some distance, but we know, you know, that's as best as they can do. Right. Um, and, and there, there were definitely ca cases and there were cases that happened in the school setting and the childcare setting, but like, but it was pretty remarkable yeah, that, um, you know, I, my, my children go to childcare and they, the, 
anyone under two doesn't wear a mask, right? So, and then um, no one's distancing because um, everyone's little and, you know, they just did the best that they could. So, um, but, but I think it's all about like thinking about your very specific situation. And, and um, I, I will say, um, I, we're sort of, you know, getting late on time, but I, I do think that there's, I feel, I totally feel like this awkward space that you're in, not that I know exactly what you're going through, but I do, we have, we recognize this is going to be very awkward for families because people are over it. And, and oftentimes people aren't thinking about kids. I do feel really hopeful though, about the coming months. Yeah. Like you said, once our, once our children can be vaccinated and that's like really coming so soon. Yeah. And I feel really good about that. <clears throat> yeah. I'm reassured. I, I'm reassured that even if we decide not to start school and, you know, at the end of August, we'll be in school this year with vaccinated kids. So that's, um, that's what I'm hanging my hat on, but I appreciate your thoughtfulness about, you know, my concerns. I, I, I know I'm not alone here, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I feel, I feel like I'm just kind of ranting, but I know a lot of people in my same position that are yeah. feeling the same way. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective and, um, and reminding us of this, this awkwardness. And we have so many families too, and you're balancing the needs of, your child and the risk for COVID, but also the developmental needs of your eight-year-old. And it's a big, it's a big place to, to, to have to make that decision. Yeah. Well, well, thank you guys. It's an opportunity. Thank, <laughs> thank, you, so much. Yes, thank yeah. you all. And thank you, Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Bell. And again, thank you to the Vermont Family Network for hosting this important forum. And um, the AAP Vermont chapter is always here to, to help. So reach out to us if you have any further questions and I'm happy to connect um, you with, with anybody. So thank you all for being with us. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Right. Good night. Good night.